Matthew chapter 5 verses 14 to 48 You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hid. Nor do men light a lamp and put it under a bushel, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. Let your light so shine before men, that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Think not that I have come to abolish the law and the prophets. I have come not to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly, I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot, will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Whoever then relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But he who does them and teaches them shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. You have heard that it was said to the men of old, you shall not kill, and whoever kills shall be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother shall be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother shall be liable to the council, and whoever says, you fool, shall be liable to the hell of fire. So, if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. Make friends quickly with your accuser, while you are going with him to court, lest your accuser hand you over to the judge, and the judge to the guard, and you be put in prison. Truly I say to you, you will never get out till you have paid the last penny. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you, that everyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and throw it away. It is better that you should lose one of your members and that your whole body shall be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better that you should lose one of your members than that your whole body should go into hell. It was also said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that every one who divorces his wife, except on the grounds of unchastity, makes her an adulteress. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Again, you have heard that it was said to the men of old, You shall not swear falsely, but shall perform to the Lord what you have sworn. But I say to you, do not swear at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Let what you say be simply yes or no. Anything more than this comes from the evil. You have heard that it was said, An eye for an eye, and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, Do not resist one who is evil. But if anyone strikes you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if anyone will sue you and take away your coat, let him have your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Give to him who begs from you, and do not refuse him who will borrow from you. You have heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbour and hate your enemy. But I say to you, Love your enemies, and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, 
and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you salute only your brethren, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? You therefore must be perfect, as your heavenly Father is perfect. The first few words of Mr. Pawson's address are missing. They should be, We now move from the attributes of a disciple to the actions of a disciple. The attributes of a disciple to the actions of a disciple, from what we are to what we do. And we consider two areas of Christian behavior or Christian conduct the social area and the spiritual area and the difference between these two areas is just this our social behavior should be made as public as possible but our spiritual behavior should be made as private as possible our purity should be shown to all men our piety should never be shown to any and it is this contrast between these two areas that I want to bring out this morning. Any reversal of these two is an offensive kind of witness. If we parade our piety and keep our purity hidden, then that kind of testimony is far from helpful to the cause of the kingdom. We deal first then with our social behavior, our purity, our standards of morality. And Jesus said of us here the same thing which he said of himself. I am the light of the world, you are the light of the world. And in the New Testament, light and darkness are moral qualities. God is light and in him is no darkness at all. Men do not like the light because they live in darkness and prefer to keep their deeds dark. Essentially then, and I mustn't repeat yesterday, indeed it leads very well into what I want to say, essentially light is to be placed in as public a place as possible where it can have the maximum influence on others, where it can both expose what is hidden in the darkness and guide those who desire to be guided by the light. And this is what we are to do, and the hardest thing thing in the Sermon on the Mount, I think, to do is first to let your light shine before men. By nature we do not want to do that. And second, to do it in such a way that they give the credit for your standards to your Heavenly Father. I think that's one of the hardest things that Jesus ever told us to do. First, to let people see our good works, but secondly, to let them see it in such a way that they give the glory to God. As Bengal notes on this verse, men are to see the shining and not the lamp, a point that was made last night. Somebody said to me after yesterday morning, if the world's in the soup, that's where the salt needs to be. And likewise, just as the salt needs to be in the soup and spread in the world and is no use in the salt cellar, the light of Christian morality must be set in public gaze if it's to be any help at all to others. From speaking of the light, Jesus goes on to speak of the law. He has not mentioned the Old Testament except by indirect quotation and implication. And there may have been those who thought that he was propounding a new religion. And so for the next few verses he describes his attitude to the law of God. There are two heresies which have appeared all the way through church history. One is to set the New Testament over against the old. That heresy is as old as Marcion. And the other is to say that Christianity has no prohibitions, that we've changed from the negative thou shalt not to the positive thou shalt. Both these positions are oversimplifications, and Jesus corrects both with these four verses. First of all, he says the purpose of the law is to be fulfilled and not abolished. Now what does this word fulfill mean? Some people assume that it means to be filled full. In other words, to expand and explain. But 
taking it in its normal usage in Matthew's Gospel, it means to be done, to be executed. Something that has been spoken is now translated into event that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet. And the law of God is to be fulfilled, it's to be done. And Jesus came, among other things, to get it done, both in himself and in other people. He did not come to abolish it, but to get it done. It's true that he got it done by planting his spirit within people so that their very love fulfilled the law, and he didn't do it in the old way by imposing external prohibitions, but he was fulfilling it in getting it done. The second verse in this section, verse 18, which includes a double negative and a truly, which emphasizes tremendously the verse, talks about the permanence of the law and would earn Jesus the title of fundamentalist today. After all, the jot was the smallest vowel and the tittle was the point of a consonant. And if a preacher says, I believe the word of God, to the smallest vowel and the point of a consonant, he's a fundamentalist. But Jesus made it absolutely clear that he did not come to alter, add to, or subtract from the word of God. It was there. He came to get it fulfilled. And any interpretation of the next part of the Sermon on the Mount, which suggests that he was correcting and altering the law of God, as for example on divorce, is a sheer contradiction of this verse. And our Lord would be inconsistent if that is what he was doing. <clears throat> Thirdly, by the way, you notice that there'll be no Bibles in heaven, there'll be no Scripture Union in heaven, incidentally, but I hope you'll all be there, <laughs> that there'll be no Scripture Union. You see, the Word of God will not pass away till heaven and earth pass away, but we won't need Bibles in heaven when you see God face to face and know even as you are known and understand as fully as he understands you. You're not going to need a Bible then, you've got the real thing. You've got God himself in direct communication. But until the end of the world, we do need the Word of God and Jesus is not going to alter that in any way. Thirdly, the perversion is that interpretation of the Word of God which relaxes the standards of God. One of the most disturbing things about a spate of publications between 1962 and 1964, particularly in the realm of morality, was the change from the absolute to the relative, to say that a thing is almost always right instead of saying it is always right. And though the degree of change was not great in towards the Quaker view of sex and the British Council of Churches report on sex and morality and other writings on the new morality, there was a definite relaxation from an absolute to a relative standard. And to drop from 100% to 99% as your standard is a radical change and we need to be very much aware of this. Now Jesus is going to tackle in six examples the kind of scriptural interpretation which relaxes the commandments and teaches others so to do. And you cannot understand the Sermon on the Mount except against the background of the teaching and practice of the scribes and the Pharisees, the interpreters of scripture in his day. They were fundamentalists themselves, but their interpretation had the effect of altering the scripture. I notice that in most cults and sects, a fundamentalist attitude is combined with an interpretation of the word of God which alters it in subtle ways. And this we are going to see in these six examples. Finally, verse 20, he says, in the practice of the law, We've got to do better than the scribes and the Pharisees. They have failed to make the grade. Now this is an extraordinary statement. For the Pharisees were outstanding in doing good deeds. They were outstanding in attending worship. They were outstanding in studying scripture. They were outstanding in practicing prayer. They were outstanding in self-discipline. They were outstanding in evangelism. They would compass sea and land to make one proselyte. 
And yet Jesus says, unless you can do better than that in keeping the law of God, you won't even reach the kingdom. Now before you can exceed, you must equal. And that must have been a shattering statement. But what he's hinting at, as he will show, is this. All of this that they achieved was outward rather than inward. The letter rather than the spirit. And therefore it, redu it resulted in a self-centered righteousness instead of a divine righteousness and he's going to illustrate that in six different ways to which we now turn before we look at these six ways may I underline for you in your minds and in your Bibles if necessary that Jesus said you have heard that it was said and the two key words are heard and said he is not referring to the Old Testament but to the oral interpretation and tradition of the scribes and the Pharisees. If Jesus quoted the Bible, he said, have you never read what was written? But here he's talking about what was heard and what was said. In other words, he's dealing with the fallacies of second-hand Bible study. Fundamentalists, yes, but who in ascribe to their own interpretation the infallibility that belongs only to the inspired word. Now may I say that all of us are guilty of this kind of confusion. The most easy form in which this happens is if you get a Bible which includes between the lines of the word of God the comments of men. No names, no pactual, but... I think you understand what I mean. It is so easy then to take that person's or that committee's interpretation as the infallible word of God and to fail to distinguish between what God said and what man said about what God said. The use of Bible reading notes can be a similar delusion or snare. And I, I was interested to learn this morning that in the early days of the Scripture Union there were no notes. You had to read the Bible by itself. Now don't get me wrong, Bible study notes can be a tremendous help. But I advise the people of my church, as soon as you can do without them, do without them. When you can walk, throw the crutch away and see how you manage. Now that may sound extraordinary advice, but it's because the subtle temptation when you're using notes is to spend far more time on the notes than on the Bible. It's a temptation. And the best sort of notes are those that do not spoon feed and don't give it all, but encourage the person to go back to the Word and get it for themselves. And this is why I stand foursquare on the second principle of the Evangelical Alliance, the right and duty of private interpretation of the Word. And my purpose in speaking to you this morning and expounding the scriptures on Sunday by Sunday is to encourage people to go and read it for themselves, not to accept my interpretation. And if you feel like coming up afterwards and saying, you know, I disagree with you on that point, hallelujah. I'm thrilled about that. We're not in an authoritarian Christian fellowship. No interpretation is infallible. But if it encourages you either in hearing the word expounded or in reading Bible study notes to go back to your Bible and, and regard that as the main source of your convictions then that's the whole object of the exercise our whole aim is to get people into the word not into our notes, not to our sermons but into the word where there they may find the word of God as it actually is and all of us I'm afraid read back into scripture what is not there heard a preacher who gave out a text he said this is my text I have two points what is in this text and what is not in this text and since we're short of time I'll take the second first <laughs> now our Lord's interpretation our Lord's interpretation of scripture is set over against the scribal interpretation of scripture this is not the New Testament correcting the old this is not Christ correcting his father's laws this is his interpretation as against theirs. And the difference was his carried the authority of God and theirs did not. So we take the examples. He gives two examples of where their interpretation was far too narrow and limited. 
was the letter and not the spirit and there is a danger in being a letteralist the first example is murder and their addition of the words liable to judgment which do not occur in the Old Testament reduced the sin to a crime and the court before which you were responsible for it to a human court in other words it limited that commandment in its scope to the crime of murder and the possibility of execution by a human judge whereas the obvious intention of the of the commandment was very much broader than that it was to cover many other things you can kill in thought and in word you don't have to stick a knife in someone's back to be a murderer in God's sight God hates all forms of murder whether in thought or word or deed and the commandment is intended to say just that to us and a letteralist approach limits it to crime one of the most difficult things I find today is to get across to people the difference between sin crime and vice vice is what you do against yourself crime is what you do against others sin is what you do against God that's a very broad distinction but I think it holds and I may have no vices and no crimes in my life but that doesn't mean I'm not a sinner Hollywood has got these three terms dreadfully confused and the commandment thou shalt not kill was dealing with sin not with crime it was meant to convey to us the thought of God about our relationships to other people and anger breaks that command wishing somebody dead which is the heart of temper wishing somebody dead is murder it is the wrong sinful attitude and our Lord says that makes you just as liable arrogance is another raka is an onomatopoeic word it's a spitting word it's a word of abuse or contempt it's a word like nitwit or rabble raka it's it's a spitting word of people and that is murder it might not be a, a knife it might just be spit they spat on Jesus before they crucified him they were murdering him then it was an act of contempt to spit at him and that is murder even if you're using a rather ineffective weapon in practice it's murder abuse is yet a third way of breaking this the word literally is moron to cause somebody a moron is to put them beyond redemption beyond appeal to condemn them now our Lord used the word moron but frankly only God has a right to use it because only God knows who really is and Jesus once said a man who lives entirely for money who pulls down his bounds and build greater and thinks of nothing else is a moron Jesus did say that and he called two other people morons but he said when you do that without the knowledge which God has when you take it upon yourself to dismiss someone as an utter moron you are virtually killing them in thought now this of course is a very high standard it goes to the spirit of the law rather than just the letter and it means quite frankly that there are many many more murderers around than we usually realize many more and that there is within the, many of our hearts the seed of this sin therefore on the positive side settle out of church and out of court go out of your way to be in a right relationship with people and not a wrong one I heard of a missionary in the South Sea Islands of the Pacific who was holding a communion service Methodist missionary and they were coming forward to the front uh, to kneel down to receive the bread and the wine and a man came forward to kneel down and as he knelt down he began to shake and, and his face was filled with rage and he jumped up and he ran out of the church a minute later he came back in calm and knelt down and took the bread and the wine and when the missionary asked him after the service what on earth went wrong he said well he said I, I'm just visiting this church but he said when I knelt down I found myself kneeling next door to the man who ate my father 
And he said, I was so angry with him that I realized I just couldn't stay for communion. And I ran out. But he said, as I ran out of the door, I saw a picture in the sky of Christ on his cross. And Christ was saying, but you did this to me. And so he said, I, I dealt with it outside the church and came back in and knelt down next to him. That's very practical. Before a man eats of that bread or drinks of that cup, let him examine himself. Settle out of court too, for one sentence is past, it's too late to try and put a situation right. Put the thing right. Don't put it wrong, but put it right. And our Lord always matched a negative injunction with a positive. The negative, don't be angry, arrogant or abusive. The positive, settle out of church and out of court. Now the second example is the matter of adultery. Now, sex is prominent in our society, in our nature, and in our Bible. It's the most realistic book is the Bible, and it says a great deal about this. And so it needs to, for this is a vital part of life. And God has two simple standards regarding this matter, very simple. And from these two standards, every other injunction may be deduced. Absolute chastity outside marriage, absolute fidelity inside marriage. That's the simple teaching of the Word of God which our Lord endorsed and which Moses taught. Thou shalt not commit adultery being concerned with the first of those standards. Sorry, with the second. Now both were being relaxed by the Pharisees by being quoted out of context and the devil loves to quote the Bible out of context now let's see what is said here I notice first of all that Jesus in both these two examples speaks to the men ancient society blamed the women as modern society tends to do we say mar far more about loose women on the streets than the men who are their customers but if there were no customers, there'd be no women. And our Lord put the responsibility for sexual standards of behavior on the men. And he spoke to the men. Now this was radical and revolutionary. And see what he says. The context of the seventh commandment, thou shalt not commit adultery, is the tenth commandment, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife. The interesting thing is the Pharisees never talked about the tenth one. Why? Because they couldn't keep it. Paul of Tarsus said this, as touching the law blameless, now that was externally, but the one commandment that he could never keep was the tenth, thou shalt not covet. He tells us that in Romans 7. And this is the context of this. It's not just what we do, it's what we covet and what we desire. And our Lord seeks to distinguish lust from love. And he says you needn't climb into someone else's bed to break this commandment. You can do it in look and in thought as well as in deed. Never man spake like this man. Do you remember when they brought the woman taken in adultery to him? Now I think, and I may be wrong here, but I think when he said he that was without sin, he wasn't meaning sin generally because that would be a foregone conclusion. He was saying, whoever is clean in this matter. And you notice it was the eldest men who went first. The youngest are always more brash and more willing to justify themselves and stick it out. But those who've sown their wild oats, they know. And the eldest went out, even to the youngest. He said, if you're clean, if you're pure in this matter, all right, you can do it. And there wasn't a man jack of them stayed very searching and challenging experience that this is needed is of course obvious from the Bible itself the lust of the eyes goes with the lust of the flesh and the case of David and Bathsheba a man after God's own heart is enough warning to us about this very matter it was Job who said to the Lord I've set a watch on my eyes lest I look at a maiden now that doesn't mean you're never to look at a girl Bishop Taylor Smith is our outstanding example here. He said he enjoyed looking at a pretty girl, but he turned his enjoyment into a prayer. 
he thanked God for making someone so beautiful and he prayed that she would be given extra strength for the extra temptations that she would have to face. To the pure, all things are pure. And he could look at a pretty girl like that. But Jesus knew the dangers and he said, you break this commandment by doing it in look and thought. Now from two commandments which were interpreted in too narrow a way, too limited a way by the scribes, he turns to two things that were interpreted in too broad a way by their additions and alterations and interpretation. You can either make the scripture too narrow or you can make it too broad. An example of the difference between the letter and the spirit, I remember a dear lady who always put on a hat to come to a church meeting. Always. But her taste in hats and her attitude to the men when she spoke in the church meeting utterly belied her keeping of the letter of that particular injunction. You see the difference? We can get so legalistic that we miss the spirit and intention of a particular injunction. And I mention that just to show that we're not free of it yet. I'm not free of it, neither are you. Legalism is one of the besetting dangers of the fundamentalist, of those who believe that every jot and tittle is God's word. We get into the letter rather than the spirit and intention. Now the two that are too broad, and the first is the matter of divorce. Now Moses did say that if you divorce your wife, give her a bill of divorcement. In other words, do it legally, do it properly. But this was said in a particular context. It didn't say you can divorce your wife for anything provided you do it properly. But that's what the Jews had begun to think it said. Do you know that by the time of our Lord, one more liberal school of Jews was arguing that you could divorce your wife for burning the breakfast? or for talking to a man in the street or for having too loud a voice or for putting too much salt in the soup or for being quarrelsome it may sound incredible but that is why they asked Jesus can you divorce your wife for every cause? every cause? they were already broadening it out now how had they done this? let's go back to Moses our Lord agrees with Moses Deuteronomy 24 states this, that if a man marries someone and finds right at the beginning that there is an unseemly thing in her, then he must write out a bill of divorcement. This happened, of course, or nearly happened to our Lord's own mother. Joseph was betrothed to Mary and he found her with child and being a just man, he resolved to divorce her privately. Now that was in accordance with the Mosaic law. The unseemly thing was obviously something which prevented that woman coming as a pure virgin to begin a one flesh relationship with her men. And you notice it referred to something that happened before the marriage, not something that happened afterwards, but which was only discovered at the beginning of the marriage. And he had to produce proofs to the relatives of this unseemly thing. Now our Lord makes only one exception to his divorce position and it is the exception which Moses made. It's the exception of something that happened before marriage. Now a number have already said that they were wondering how I was going to deal with this when I got to it. It was my doubtful privilege to give uh, a paper on the meaning of this word pornia to a theological study group in London on which sat Professor Anderson who was then on the Commission for Divorce for the Church of England uh, and was chaired by Mr. Stott. And Mr. Stott introduced me as an expert on fornication who was going to give us a paper on the subject. <laughs> um, <laughs> very doubtful <laughs> thing. Well now, I have that paper with me and if you want to look at it, you can see it afterwards. I haven't time to go into it now. But at the end of it, there was an admission from the group that the biblical evidence was very clear. There is not a single case of fornication and adultery ever being mixed, confused, or interchanged. And the word refers, as the many Bible dictionaries now admit, the word ref 
refers to premarital intercourse and to nothing else. Therefore, there is no ground of divorce in Christian thinking for anything that happens after marriage. It's interesting that English law doesn't even allow the exception that Jesus allowed, but that be as it may. Jesus said the original intention is the thing that a man leaves that two people leave their family and become one flesh and cleave to one another. That's the intention. The only exception is where one of them is not really in a fit condition to do this, for they have already had a one flesh relation with someone else. Where that is discovered, then the marriage doesn't get off to a right start. And this was a concession to the hardness of the human heart which finds that sort of thing difficult to forgive and forget. And Jesus made the concession as Moses made the concession. But the point is this. He is saying, in arguing about the exception, you've made the exception the rule. And if I spent most time this morning on the exception, I'd fall into the same trap as the Pharisees. The rule is the thing, not the exception. And the rule is, absolute fidelity inside marriage. It is a permanent state of one man with one woman, monogamy. That is the principle and therefore remarriage is adultery and 75% of the divorcees of this country remarry and most divorces are taken for remarriage. It's possible of course to get a separation without going the whole way in a divorce. But most divorces are for remarriage and our Lord did set this standard. Now it's a difficult standard, it's a hard standard. Just as his standard of absolute chastity outside marriage is hard. The question is, are we to lower God's standards to human nature or are we by God's grace to raise human nature to God's standards? That is the final issue before us. The next example is much the same thing. An exception became a rule by faulty interpretation. Now this part of the sermon is a little irrelevant to our society because swearing in this sense is not too common. I know the ordinary kind of swearing. I've worked among working men. I worked with a man who had the d dubious reputation of being able to swear longer than anyone else without repeating himself. And I know the atmosphere in which many have to work, but that's not the kind of swearing mentioned here. Here is thought, the, here Jesus is thinking of the swearing, which is the use of an oath to make a man speak the truth. It is a recognition of the fact that it is not easy for us always to be truthful and to speak the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. And in certain circumstances, it is absolutely vital that a man speak the truth. And one way of doing that is to bring the fear of God into his heart by making him swear by God to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and overcome certain other motives that might not tell that by making the fear of God the main motive. Mind you, where the fear of God is absent, there's absolutely no point in making a man swear such an oath. And I can't help feeling that handing a Bible to a man in the witness box in a legal court in this country has become an absolute formality because there isn't the general fear of God which an oath exploits to get the truth. But where you've got people who believe in God as in the Jewish nation, then they could use oaths and did. And one of the Ten Commandments forbade them ever to take the name of God in vain. Now, from that very limited use of oaths, the scribal interpretation had made swearing a very common everyday thing. Because they had developed a casuistry that said, as long as you don't use the name of God, it's all right. You can swear by heaven, you can swear by earth, you can swear by your head, all sorts of things. Do you know, common or garden swearing started that way. The word bloody is a shortened form of by Our Lady, as you may have realized. Just as we say Malad for my Lord, we used to say Maladi. And By Our Lady became bloody, and that's where the word came from. It's simply an oath which got into everyday speech. 
and something sacred became something profane and most profanity deals with the two sacred areas of life sex and religion and profanes the sacred now that's what happens when oath taking becomes frivolous and common and Jesus is saying this whatever oath you use God is in the situation if you swear by your hair you can't alter that if you swear by the earth it's God's footstool if you say by heaven that's true you are swearing by God's dwelling place in other words you cannot speak without God being involved in what you say and the real intention is that all your speech should be in the presence of God and therefore you should be a man of integrity when you say yes it should be the sort of yes that knows God listens when you say no, it should be that integrity of speech that knows that for every idle word men will be judged in the day of judgment. Our speech betrays us. Now there are many ways, of course, of being dishonest. Exaggeration is one, a very common one in Christian circles, about the results of a crusade, about blessing in a particular occasion very easy to try and magnify Lord by exaggerating to his glory there is also the dishonesty of remaining silent and not saying what should be said there are many ways of doing this but the intention of the scripture is that your speech should be such as will realize the presence of God at every point it's said of George Fox who I'm afraid carried this to illogical conclusions by refusing to take an oath even in court. But it's said of him that when he said verily, it meant verily. And there was no changing George Fox. That should be our integrity of speech. You don't need to be saying all the time, honestly, honestly, honestly. Some people who are always saying that make you wonder very much whether you can take anything that they say. And if they have to keep saying honestly, you wonder what they mean when they leave it out. There are occasions when an oath is right. Jesus himself on occasion was put on oath and put himself on oath. So did Paul. Paul would swear by God or say before God I lie not. There are times when something of such crucial importance needs to be said that you can say you're verily verily. You can say more than yes and no. But that's the exception and the general rule is this. I see nothing in this verse as the Essenes and the Quakers did to forbid oath-taking in a court or on certain occasions. This is dealing with everyday conversation. Now we come to two further examples which were interpreted in too harsh a manner. And harshness again is a besetting sin of Christians. It was said of one great expositor of the word that he had so much love for the Lord that he hadn't much left for people. Do you know what I mean? We can be hard in our rigid interpretation, in our logical deduction, so hard that we escape the real import of the word of God. Now let's take two examples. The first is the matter of vengeance. Vengeance is a valid and right thing but it must be properly applied and the one thing we need to remember is this vengeance belongs to me says the Lord I will repay and to take from God the responsibility for vengeance and exercise it personally is too harsh <coughs> an interpretation now Moses three times said an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth three times but when you look at the context, listen, first, it was said once when there was an injury to an unborn child because of an assault on the pregnant mother. A very serious crime indeed. The second time, it was for the deliberate disfigurement of a neighbor. And the third time, it was for perjury in a court that caused an injustice to another three very serious crimes 
This was not a general principle, it was only in those three cases. Furthermore, it ensured that in those three cases there was a strong deterrent for the serious crime of injuring an unborn child, deliberately disfiguring your neighbor, and causing an injustice to someone else by perverting the legal process. Furthermore, this Lex Talionis, which is the oldest human law in existence, it's in the Code of Hammurabi too, measure for measure, tit for tat, this law limits the amount of retribution in strict proportion and is therefore an expression of justice. It's not a barbaric thing, it is an expression of justice. But the most important thing is that in the Old Testament, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, was a responsibility that must be placed in the hands of the judges, the legal authorities, and never in the hands of the individual. But when the scribes interpreted this verse, they said it gave anyone full permission to give him a black eye when he gave you one. And this was an utter perversion. It justified private revenge. And it led to the conception of the Jew which appears in Sherlock with his pound of flesh in the Merchant of Venice. Now our Lord, I don't think, was dealing with the question of political pacifism. May I, I say that very sincerely because I have some wonderful Christian friends who would disagree. But I don't think he was dealing with the question of public and political pacifism. He was dealing with personal revenge. The question of pacifism must be settled on other scriptures, Romans 13 among them, but it is not dealt with here. He is not saying we must not apply justice, as Tolstoy thought he was saying, as Gandhi thought he was saying, as some young Christians who have got caught up in C&D thought he was saying. Our Lord is not dealing with political policy or with social justice. He's dealing with personal revenge. Nor is he cultivating indifference to social injustice. Some have thought that resist not evil meant that you must not tackle social injustice. That again is a perversion. What did he mean? He gives us four examples to show it. If you're injured, no revenge. If you suffer injustice, no rights. If you personally are insulted and suffer indignity, no reputation. And if you are the victim of importunity, no return. Now these are four examples of personal dealings. There's a man on the television recently said, if somebody hits me on the right cheek, I turn my left cheek and bring my knee up sharply. <laughs> That's literalism again. You notice that it's the word right. Have you ever tried hitting someone on their right cheek? I hope not, but if you realize, do it, you'll realize it's a backhander. It's a phrase for any dirty blow. That's the right cheek. And it was a phrase for a dirty blow, a dirty trick. You can enlarge the meaning. Somebody plays you a dirty trick. You deliberately place yourself so that they can do it again. That's the positive injunction. Turn. Turn. Now this is against human nature very much. The second is injustice. If somebody takes something from you that is a luxury, give them something that is your necessity. You can do without a coat, but you can't do without a cloak in the Middle East. The coat is a luxury, it's the underwear. The cloak is what you sleep in, you've got to have a cloak. Which is why Amos and the Old Testament criticized those who took cloaks from the poor. Have you ever heard the cynical proverb, where there's a will, there's relatives? More families break, break up over that than perhaps anything else. But Jesus says when that happens, when they take something from you by law, let them have something more. If anyone compels you to go one mile, now remember that this was in occupied territory and a Roman soldier had the right to lay the flat blade of his spear on anyone's shoulder and compel them to carry his baggage a statute thousand paces, a milliard. And in an occupied territory, it was with great reluctance that Jews submitted to this indignity of having to collaborate with the enemy. Jesus said, go a second mile. 
as somebody has delightfully commented, the first mile is rendering to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and the second mile is rendering to God the things that are God's. Going the second mile, you notice positive again. If somebody hits you on the cheek, turn. If somebody takes your coat, let him have your cloak. If somebody compels you to go one mile, go two miles. Every time it's a positive injunction to lay yourself wide open to exploitation and abuse. And the fourth is, if a beggar comes to you, give him what he asks. Don't expect it back again, give him what he asks. I remember having supper once with Toyohiko Kagawa, that great Japanese Christian. And I remember him saying this, why should the devil have all the world's spendthrifts? He said this to justify his own reckless generosity with his fortune in the slums of Tokyo. Why should the devil have all the world's spendthrifts? Jesus is the perfect example of these four injunctions. They struck him on the cheek at his trial, but he didn't strike back. He let them do it again. They took his clothes off him, and he was stripped naked. They compelled him, exactly the same word as here, they compelled him to carry his cross. And one of his last acts was to be generous to a dying thief who begged something from him. He was the perfect example of all these things. He always practiced what he preached. And the final example is that of malice. Here we come to the heart of the Sermon on the Mount. And the most blatant misinterpretation of Scripture the Pharisees ever made. Moses had said, love your neighbor. And the logical expositors got to work on this phrase. They said, now that means that if you've got to love some, that you've got to have a different attitude to others. And the opposite of love is hate. So there are others you've got to hate. And the opposite of neighbor is enemy. Neighbor being regarded as a fellow Jew and a friend. Therefore, enemy is regarded as a Gentile. And therefore, this really teaches you to hate. Now, it all sounded logical to them. May I give a modern example, and I do so with hesitation, but I think it illustrates what I mean. The fact that the Bible states that God predestines us to our salvation does not logically mean that he predestines others to damnation. Now, to our logic, it seems to follow. But I wonder if it doesn't lead to too harsh an interpretation. Most theological systems are logical. I find the Bible is not always logical. I cannot reconcile human responsibility and divine predestination, except that I must believe that God has free will as well as I have a choice to make. And I find that both the Arminian and the Calvinist would love to rewrite the New Testament in certain parts. There seems to be contradictions that whosoever will may come and only those whom the Father draws will come. Well, I'm content to leave that. I just must beware in my interpretation of being too logical and drawing what to me are valid deductions that become too hard and too harsh. And so they said, love your neighbor. Right, logically, that must have an opposite. That must have a corollary. And the corollary is hate your enemy. Jesus said that is not a logical deduction. You should argue from love rather than logic when you interpret a passage like this. And so in the heart of the Sermon on the Mount, he tells us to love our enemies. Now the Old Testament had said that. Proverbs had said, if your enemy hungers, feed him. If he thirsts, give him to drink, for you'll heap coals of fire on his head. A young Christian in India reading that said, oh, that's terrific, I'd like to see him scorch. <laughs> well, now that's not the spirit of the uh, injunction. Actually, it goes back to a practice in Egypt where a penitent sinner would walk to the temple carrying a metal tray of burning charcoal on his head as a sign of penitence. It really means to be penitent. And if you return good for evil, that is likely to lead to penitence. A young man went into the barrack rooms. He knelt down to say his prayers by his bunk because there was nowhere else to do so and two heavy army boots were thrown very hard at his head and caused him much pain. A sergeant sleeping opposite had thrown them. 
The following morning when the sergeant got out of bed, there were his boots back again by his bed, polished. And the sergeant said, I've got to find out what makes a man do that. And he became a Christian as a result. To return evil for evil is animal. To return good for evil or evil for good is satanic. To return good for good is human. But to return good for evil is divine. And Jesus said even the worst men, tax collectors, even the people outside God's people, the Gentiles, have a reciprocal decency. That's just being like men to return good for good. You're arguing from this scripture as if you're a man. But you are to be like God. Perfect as he is perfect. And the word means inclusive, comprehensive, all round. Just as he loves all, you are to love all. That's what the word perfect there means. It doesn't mean the absolute perfection. The word means to be complete in your love. And he sends his son on the good and the evil. Or as the old poem I used to learn as a child, the rain it raineth on the just and on the unjust fella, but it raineth more so on the just because the unjust's got the just's umbrella. But it's the same rain. <laughs> and and God's, God's providential care is over all his creatures. It's inclusive. His son and his rain come to all. Therefore, we are to be all-inclusive as our Father in heaven is all-inclusive. We are to love all as he loves all. That's the spirit of thou shalt love thy neighbor. Who is thy neighbor? Read the Good Samaritan again. Anyone in need, whether he's your neighbor or not, whether he lives next door to you or not, whether he's of your race or not, your enemy may be your neighbor for this purpose. 